everybody here today. Just as you're taking your, your seats there, just wanted to, to say a special welcome to any guests that we might have visiting with us this morning. We're glad that you're here with us. And we have some ways that we'd like for you to connect with us. If you can, you can scan that QR code up there on the screen or in your offering box in front of you there. You'll be able to find a little uh, fill out form there that also has the QR code on it. You can scan it that way or you can text the word welcome to 803-590-1975. Those are ways that we can get connected with you. A way that we can stay connected is by being a part of the loop. And so text the word loop to 803-590-1975. That'll help you know a few things that we have going on. But another way to know some things going on is by picking up a newsletter, a calendar. It's right back over here in this little room, our welcome room that we have. And so our next steps room is, is also. And so you could just pick that up there and know some different things. Many of you would have gotten an email with that last week, but if you didn't, know that that's available for you to pick up and love for you to have that. But some of the things that we do have coming up, well, we've got a New York mission trip report tonight. So we'd love to have you back at five o'clock to hear what the Lord did with our New York team. And so look, love for you guys to join us there. Also, we have a men's supper coming up. And so that men's supper will be this coming Thursday. And that will be at the Little Cafe at 6 o'clock. And not to be outdone, ladies also have a dinner coming up, which is at August 9th at Hobo's. And so that's at 6 p.m. And so just those are a few things that you can know. But to know a little bit more about what's going on, be a part of the loop or pick up that newsletter. I want to invite you, if you would, to join me as we get today started in the Word of Prayer. Father, we come before you this morning and we're thankful that we have every opportunity to come before your throne because you've granted that to us. By the power of your Holy Spirit, through the power of your gospel, how you gave your life for us, what you went through, Lord, on the cross, enduring the wrath that we deserve. And then you took the sin to the grave and you left it there and you rose on the third day. And so we want to praise you this morning. And so let all praise be unto your name because of what you have done. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. I invite you, if you would, to stand. We'll sing together when I survey the wondrous cross. When I survey the wondrous cross, Yet we esteemed him stricken, 
smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Which remains saying as we sing the power of the cross. if you would to just come down to the altar kneel anybody else that feels that they have a, just a prayer request this morning I want to invite you to come down but also I want to invite you if you would just to please come and lay a hand on Pastor Chris as we encourage our pastor as he's going to be leading us today
of the Word of God, turn with me, please, to Isaiah, uh, chapter 52. We'll start there. Sometimes when you have to unplug it, plug it back in. There we go. That might be better. How's that? I'll take it off. I speak with my hands, but I'll do my best with this today. Just the yellow one, Keith, if that's all right. Good. All right. The enemy would want nothing more than for you to hear the truth of Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. The fourth of the servant's songs of a suffering servant. Beginning in verse 13 of chapter 52. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted as many were astonished at you. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance. Form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he's heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. No beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. On him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He is put into grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of men, 
makes intercession for the transgressors. Father, this is your word for us, your people. And so I ask that you would use me to be an instrument of your grace, of your Spirit's work of conviction, of your Spirit's working to bring about repentance and belief from those who may be far from you, to refresh those who are yours, to challenge us all, to humble ourselves before an amazing God whose love poured out for us on the cross gives us life. In his name we pray. Amen. There once was a high ranking official in the uh, court of Queen Candace. And this high ranking official was from the region of Ethiopia. He remains nameless in our text, but he has a unique physical situation as a eunuch. By God's design, this man had become attractive to the Jewish religion, and he'd gone to Jerusalem to worship. Trouble is, though, his physical status as a eunuch meant he probably would not have access to the complete temple. His worship had been restricted. And so as the early church was spreading, an angel of the Lord told Philip to head south on the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. Along the way, Philip came across the eunuch, who was headed home, seated in his chariot, reading the prophet Isaiah. The angel told Philip to go over to the chariot, and as he ran up to the chariot, he heard the eunuch reading a passage from the book of Isaiah. Philip reached the chariot and asked the eunuch if he understood what he was reading, and the eunuch said, How can I, unless someone guides me? Now, I started thinking about that for our own selves. How can we understand this text unless the Spirit guides us? The answer is we can't. We cannot understand this unless the Spirit interprets it for us. Now, here, Philip, having the Spirit, is invited to come up and sit in the chariot with this eunuch. And the eunuch was reading Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. And so the eunuch is reading about the fact that the servant that's being described in Isaiah 53 was utterly humiliated and yet vindicated by God. The servant's shame was part of God's divine plan to pay a price and remove the obstacle that sin creates between people and God. And so as Philip starts to unpack the scripture for the eunuch, helping him see how Jesus was the suffering servant and what he accomplished through his death and resurrection meant that by faith, the eunuch could be given new life and a restored relationship with the God of the universe. The, the eunuch is ecstatic and he says, look, he asks this question that makes this text so important for Luke in the book of Acts, the detail for us. He says, what prevents me from being baptized? What prevents me? Remember, this eunuch had been restricted from temple access because of his physical characteristics. And here he's reading about this servant who's been humiliated before God and people, and he gets vindicated by God. And so here's this, this news. As Philip unpacks this truth, and he sees this opportunity now to be baptized, and he says, what prevents me? Nothing prevents him. See, what the servant did, what the, servant, the suffering servant did, gave life, potentially, to this eunuch. He personally received it by faith. It was personally applied through the wounds that Christ took on our behalf. His name, our name's written in his wounds. We just sang about it. And it's personally effective for all today as well, by faith. The word was opened up to the eunuch. The eunuch said, well, then, I, you mean I'm able to have a relationship with the God of the universe? Philip said, yes, you are. You mean my physical situation doesn't restrict me from knowing God anymore? No, it doesn't. Church, what happened there is the same gift that's given to us. You mean that sin that once kept us away from God has been done away with through Christ so that we can have access to God now? Yes, that's what I'm saying. 
And what the suffering servant did in Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12 is available to change us too. So the eunuch thought his physical situation, that humiliation kept him from full access to God. We know that his physical characteristics, not our own, have nothing to do with our being separated from God. It's not about the physical characteristics, right? It's our sin. The eunuch didn't understand that at first, but when, the, when, when Philip unpacked the text, he got to see, whoa, wait, it's not about my physical situation, it's my sin. God knew human beings were racking up sin. We couldn't make up for the things we'd done wrong. Justice needed to be served and we couldn't pay it. We're helpless to help ourselves. So God helped in a way that only God could. He sent his son Jesus to make a substitutionary payment for our sins. I sometimes describe it as the great exchange. His life for ours. See, the Bible says every time we cross a moral line, there's a price to be paid. Every time we cheat on a test. Every time we misrepresent the truth. Every time we take something that isn't ours. Every time we say something to hurt someone else, even if they don't know it. We're talking about gossip. Every time we cross a sexual boundary, not just physically, but fantasizing about it in our minds. Every time we blank, you fill in the blank. There's a price to be paid. And God knew that we couldn't pay the price. So he sent his son to pay the price for us. Our punishment, however, wasn't a monetary fine like paying off a traffic ticket. It's a spiritual one. When we do something that separates us from God, the penalty <laughs> is life separated from God forever in a place called a hell. It has to be this way, church. Because God is just. He wasn't going to compromise his justice to restore broken men and women. But praise God, he didn't want to leave us broken men and women. God so loved the world that he didn't want there to be eternal separation from us. So God sent Jesus to pay for our sin. And the only way to accept that payment is through spirit-empowered repentance and belief. But here's the thing. That rebellion that we inherited at conception, made manifest immediately at birth, means we never would have believed in this offer of gift, sin, payment. It really just seems too good to be true. How could God maintain his justice and yet offer a restored relationship with him after all the wrong that we've done? Something extraordinary was going to have to take place that would make us sit up and take notice. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did. Something historic, something supernatural, something sacrificial. That's what our text this morning, through the prophet Isaiah, seeks to communicate hundreds of years before it actually took place. Look again at 52.13. We'll walk through this text together. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. According to Isaiah, one day God will send his servant and that servant will act wisely. Some translations that you are reading might say will prosper. Some translations might say be successful. Well, lots of people have had success. So God clarifies a little bit further. He says his servant will be so successful that one day he'll be raised up and highly exalted. Now that seems unheard of for a servant, right? A suffering servant highlighted here in Isaiah's prophecy would get to the status of being exalted. The word exalted uh, it signifies a rising up in exaltation. Jesus was wise. Jesus was successful. There was a moment when it didn't look like any of this great exaltation was going to happen. But before we get there, we must see that exalting Jesus isn't just something that we wait until heaven to do. Our families, our church family, your own family must be led at all times to exalt the king. Whether it's during family dinner, whether it's nightly devotions, whether it's during a difficult season in your lives. We are to exalt Christ in all things. Now, exalting our king in conversation or 
Social media means we need to think before we speak or type. Asking ourselves, does this really build up the kingdom or does it tear it down? Because see, exalting Jesus is a daily responsibility for believers. Yet this servant that Isaiah is describing seems far from exaltation. Look at verse 14. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. The sight of the servant, okay, would cause adults to... And parents would rush over and cover the eyes of their kids. You wouldn't, want, you wouldn't want them to see this. We know Jesus was beaten so badly that he was almost unrecognizable. His torture using that Roman cat of nine tails was meant to instill fear in all the onlookers that you don't want to mess with the ruling class. For Pilate, it's almost like he wanted the beatings to be so bad that the Jews might look at his mangled body and say, you know, that's enough. It's not what they did. It seems like that must have been Pilate's hope. The fact that he was tortured so, having deserved none of it, and then his subsequent exaltation would cause some to scratch our heads and wonder, what's going on here? It's a reminder that God's way of doing things doesn't always make sense to us, and yet look what it accomplishes in verse 15. So shall he sprinkle, that's a funny word, we'll talk about that in a moment. You might have a little number, some of you, do you have a little number by the word sprinkle? Just put up your hand, I can see you see it. Okay, yeah, there's a little number there. And, and if you look down, that's what that means is you look down at the bottom of the page and, and, and my Bible it says, or star, I don't like that. I think that the, I think what the ESV commentators have put here is better, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of them. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Now, the word sprinkle has priestly sacrificial overtones to it. Isaiah is thinking about what Israelite priests used to do. The sprinkling of blood meant a cleansing. So see, on the Day of Atonement, the priest, the priest would come and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, restoring Israel to the presence of God. And that's what Jesus does for us. He's both our priest and our sacrifice. And his work is so thorough. Look what it says. He'll sprinkle many nations. It'll reach the nations. So the sprinkling of nations refers to the blood of Christ being applied to everyone who repents and believes for the remission of sins, not just the Jews. That's good news for us today, church. If that blood that we saying about today is sprinkled for us. One's conscience can now be purified. Hebrews 9.22 says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say in 12.24, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You know, Abel's blood cried out for vengeance. Suffering servant, Jesus, prophesied in Isaiah 52, sprinkled a blood of forgiveness for every people and tribe and nation and tongue. You know, that was good news for the eunuch that Philip was speaking to. For you see, Luke was trying to help his readers understand how the gospel was spreading from Jerusalem, just like chapter 1, verse 8 of the book of Acts mentioned. Because Ethiopia was considered by many during the early church's days to be the end of the earth. How interesting is that, right? If you start to read Acts 8, you see the gospel leaving Jerusalem. And here, when it gets to this unit, many saw that as getting into the end of the earth. And so that sprinkling is happening. It's going to the nations. It's good news for us, too. No one ever thought of removing guilt this way. Jesus judged our evil by bearing it himself in his own sufferings for the joy, the text says, the joy set before him. Our mission as the church then is to communicate a good news that's really unheard of in the usual sound bites regarding remedies for human misery. If you go to the self-help section of Books A Million over here or look it up on Amazon, you're not going to find a suffering servant who sprinkled his blood for the remission of sin so that you might be set free from a conscience of guilt. 
multitudes. That same offer of restored relationship that was given to the eunuch. See, the eunuch thought this was amazing. He wanted to know more about this. He wanted to surrender. He asked, what must I do to be baptized? Not that baptism saves, but he understood what was happening. The Spirit was drawing him to want to demonstrate that, what was happening in his heart, demonstrated by his baptism. It's really something that's supernatural and spectacular. The eunuch thought it was, and so he responded. The same offer of a restored relationship with the Father is available today, even to those right here in this room who desire to trust Christ for salvation. So as you cross over into Isaiah 53, you're not uh, encountering a prophecy right at the start. You're encountering a question. Who has believed what he's heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? To understand the question, we need to remember Isaiah's audience, the people of Israel. There, right before this, Isaiah made clear the nations were going to benefit from the work of the suffering servant. But Israel doesn't want anything to do with this. The arm of the Lord, that, that really is referring to Christ's strength, has been revealed, but nobody seemed to care. At least not his own. John 1.11 says he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Israel cried and repeated, Awake, awake, O arm of the Lord. But when the arm arrived, they didn't recognize him. They were looking for one to arrive with royal banners. They were looking for the mighty army. But look at how he came, verse 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant. Like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. No beauty that we should desire him. Israel's Messiah was to come with the royal name of David attached to him. But the royal house of David had been cut down long ago. Centuries had passed since the son of David sat on that throne, and Jesus didn't come with a magnificent gaze or a charming smile, nothing extraordinary, just plainness that meant he was easy to pass by on the streets. It says he came up like a root from dry ground, basically symbolizing his coming out of a know-nothing town, supposedly from a lower-class tradesman whose mom was a virgin. Talk about strange birth story, right? God the Father had his eye on him, and he was working his will through that young lad's years of physical growth. It was going to take the arm of the Lord to help us believe news like this. You know, we're really more superficial than we like to think. We're quick to look at the surface and judge by appearances, but Jesus didn't even try to be impressive at that level. So as a result, he was despised and rejected. Look at verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. The Sanhedrin rejected him during three trials that took place during the early morning hours of Good Friday. The people rejected him when Pilate asked if he should release Jesus or Barabbas as a gesture of goodwill for the Passover festival. The crowd made it clear they wanted Barabbas released. Pilate then asked, what should we do with Jesus? And the crowd shouted all the more, crucify him, crucify him. If we'd been there, we would have been shouting that too. We would have. Crucify him. Aren't you know why? Because our sin blinds us to the one who appeared, who was the true remedy for the guilt that wrecks us. We turned a blind eye and a deaf ear. <clears throat> why did Jesus stoop so low? Because he had to become like us, for us to become like him. Isaiah details his work, look, as sin bearer. Look back at verses four through six. Surely he's borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All 
we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He bore our sicknesses. This was true from his first days of ministry. Everywhere he went, Jesus bore people's sicknesses by offering them comfort and healing. He was regarded as stricken. On the Day of Atonement, a special goat called the scapegoat was brought into the temple and stricken by the sins of the people. Jesus was stricken and his blood was shed so that our sins may be taken away. Jesus was pierced. Instead of breaking his legs, his side was pierced to verify his death. Jesus took our punishment and that entire section hits hard on the cost of atonement. You see, the onlookers here thought that the servant was suffering for his own sins at the hand of God. But notice how verse 5 transitions. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. And by the end of verse 6, it's clear the sufferings of the servant were substitutionary. Grace completely covers sin. God has laid on him the iniquity of us all, the innocent for the guilty. Look at verse 7. He was oppressed, afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence was no deceit in his mouth. You know, imagine for a moment what it would be like to be put on trial. Picture yourself before court officials with a courtroom full of hecklers and protesters. And there you are being accused of something that you didn't do. But on your side, there's no defense attorney, no friend. It seems as if everyone is against you and you know you didn't do what you're being charged with doing. That's the situation that Jesus faced, not once, not twice, but six times over a six hour period in the early morning hours of Good Friday. And in all of those trials, he did not defend himself. Now, Jesus did respond to Caiaphas, but it wasn't to defend himself. It wasn't to try to get him acquitted or rescue him from going to the cross. As a matter of fact, his response of who he was only affirmed what Caiaphas had already said about him. Caiaphas demanded, tell us if you're the Christ, the Son of God. Matthew 27, 64 says, Jesus says to him, you've said so. But I tell you, from now on, you'll see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. In the case of Caiaphas, he was desiring to trap Jesus in order to justify his hatred of him. But let's make this personal for a moment. Have you ever gone before God demanding an answer from him? Demanding that he heal you or a loved one? Demanding that he answer you with a sign? Demanding that he show you the way, but all you hear is silence? You know, while Jesus may have stood silent before his accusers, he is not silent in the midst of whatever <laughs> you are facing today. I like how Kevin Beyond, pastor up in Charlotte, says, he says, in these last days, God speaks to us not by many and various ways, but in one way, through his Son. And he speaks through his Son by the revelation of the Son's redeeming work that we find first predicted and prefigured in the Old Testament, then recorded in the Gospels, and finally unpacked by the Spirit through the Apostles and the rest of the New Testament. Friends, when the scriptures are read, the Spirit speaks. When we're tempted to demand that God speak to us about a certain situation, let's instead silence ourselves and go to the Word and listen to the voice of God. Now, why did Isaiah feel like we needed to know about Jesus' silence? Why is that a big deal? Well, because Jesus' silence and mission made a way for our salvation. You see, his silence in defending himself demonstrated his absolute perfection. His death was all part of the Father's plan, and he was committed to it as his cry in the garden made perfectly clear. For if he had spoken up, even given one whisper of protest, that would have denied the voluntariness of his offer. You know, we've all been in a position where someone was accusing us of something that we think we 
had not done. What do we do in those situations? When we're accused, we typically defend ourselves. One, when nobody else will. If an enemy claims you cheated and you have a friend nearby to defend you, that's great. But if you have no friend to speak up for you, you defend yourself and say, no, I didn't. We defend ourselves when nobody else will. And two, when proving our innocence will benefit us, we'll speak up for ourselves. If it doesn't really matter, we might not bother to refute someone's claims. But in Jesus' case, it really mattered. His life was on the line. But what do we do when we're guilty? We say, yes, it was me. I did it. I was wrong. When we're guilty, we should own up to it, admit our mistake, then pay the price. If it means a $200 traffic ticket for a traffic violation, then pay the $200 and move on. But Jesus didn't have a debt because he wasn't guilty. He was charged with blasphemy. Blasphemy is claiming to be God. Thing is, you can't blaspheme by claiming to be God if you are God. Jesus wasn't guilty of blasphemy. Now, the Romans wouldn't execute for blasphemy, even if he was. So the priests had to accuse him of treason. Yet he wasn't guilty of treason. He didn't threaten Caesar or Rome or try to stir up an insurrection. Jesus was innocent on all charges, but he remained silent. Because if he'd spoken up, he would have been set free. If he'd said something, he would have been set free. He proved he had the wisdom to get himself out of the traps that his accusers had set for him many times before. And if he'd been set free, he wouldn't have paid the price for our sin, leaving us to have to pay the price for our own sin. And church, the only way we could have paid for our own sin was to experience eternal torment in hell, separated from the goodness of God. Like a sheep before its shearers, Jesus was silent because he knew we couldn't pay for our own sin. Why did he do all of this? Because he loves us. We know that from John 3 16, but, but there is actually a greater God glorifying, God magnifying reason that he remained silent. He was willing to die because Jesus loved his Father. And Jesus surrendered himself completely to his Father's will. That surrender meant suffering, but it also meant victory. Look at verse 10 and following. Yet it was the will of the Lord. See, there it is, right there in the text. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I'll divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many. He makes intercession for the transgressors. That last part of verse 12, it speaks of, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Said a little bit differently like this, he willingly submitted to death, and was counted among the rebels, yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. You see, the story of the Messiah finishes with this surprising twist. Who would have expected the God of the universe to die like a criminal? Alongside criminals, compared to criminals. After all, Messiahs rule, right? They triumph, they win. Yet, Maybe it shouldn't be so surprising, given that Jesus' beginnings were especially unique. In stories of old, great heroes are often from nobility, but the story of Jesus begins with a humble birth. In a stable, not an inn, not a hospital, attended not by physicians, but by shepherds, the working class instead of the upper class. So maybe it's not surprising then that when Jesus died, he died with the lowest class. The sinless Son of God assumed the role of sinful human beings, one who was so disregarded by the people they would rather him die as a known criminal. In place of one who was a true criminal, 
So Jesus was led to Golgotha where he was crucified between two thieves. What purpose might have been served by having Jesus placed among criminals in such an awful, humiliating, degrading way? Jesus wasn't a criminal, but I'm a criminal. I haven't obeyed the law perfectly all my life. You see, when a person comes to the face the reality that they're a lawbreaker, they usually do one of two things. They either brush it off, thinking, yeah, I've really the law, but not very badly. Or comfort themselves by saying, everybody breaks the law at some point. It's not impossible. I mean, it's impossible not to. This way of thinking is a big mistake. When some people break a moral law, they, they do brush it off. Or they beat themselves up over their action with remarks like, I'm a terrible person. I'm worthless. I can never be forgiven. See, Jesus was counted among criminals because he wanted us to know that no matter how low we think we are, no matter how far from God we think we've gotten, he went lower. The king of the universe came down to our level to bring us up to his. Matthew, the gospel writer, records Jesus' comparison to criminals and his crucifixion with criminals so that every person can know that no matter how far they've gone, Jesus went further. How far did Jesus come for us? Flip over to Philippians chapter 2, if you would, please. Philippians chapter 2. Talking about how far Jesus came for us. Beginning with verse 6. Well, back up. You should back up, right? The thought begins in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but into himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. No one and nothing has ever covered as much downward distance as Jesus has. Let's not miss that the servant did not suffer as a passive or unwilling victim, powerless before the misdeeds of others. He did it willingly, with deliberate intent. He stepped so low, so that we would know no matter how far down we may feel, he's come down to us. That's incredible news of God's great love for us. It's incredible news that our minds can't even fully conceive it. But Paul doesn't finish with Christ's death on the cross because for every step downward that Jesus took, God restored and highly exalted his son. Look at verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, not just exalted, highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that's above every name, so that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, the exaltation from God over his Son is so global that one day every knee on earth Every knee in heaven, every knee under the earth will bow before him. One day, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. I want you to say that in a moment. I want you to, to say it out loud. Jesus Christ is Lord. Go ahead. Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes, we get to say that now freely. One day, one day, every human and every angel will proclaim it with great conviction. But right now, we get to say it out of joy for what our God has done. Jesus Christ is Lord. The suffering of Jesus is over. Guess what? He's now at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding for the transgressors that had been counted among him as a rebel. Jesus Christ is now highly exalted to intercede for us. Jesus has instituted a priestly system through which people can now approach God. Those priests were even tasked with going into the most holy place and offer a blood sacrifice for the sin of the people. But Jesus' work on the cross brought access to God through his blood, no longer needing the blood of bulls and goats. We have a high priest, Jesus, who was numbered among the transgressors, yet without sin, who could restore us to God. 
All of this matters to that eunuch on the side of the road. It matters to us as well. Go back over to Isaiah. I'm not sure whether Philip got to Isaiah 56. Go to 56 if you will. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure Philip, as he was speaking to the human, made it to Isaiah 56. But look what 56 says. I won't do the whole thing, okay? That last part of verse 3 of 56, look and follow, and look what it says. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Wow. Philip probably didn't get to that. The eunuch probably didn't know that was there unless, you know, he, he went on reading maybe after Philip left him, you know, miraculously Philip left him. What a God! One day those who felt like they were dry and cut off and had no hope for a future, God says, I'll give you a name. My kingdom. And so all of this matters. Because number one, it reminds us of who we are. We were bought with a price. We're not just no nothing nobodies on the planet, biding our time until we die. We were bought with a price and given a mission to go and make disciples who make disciples who cover the world with the glory of God's name. It also discovers that we haven't gone too far from the reaches of His grace. This matters because none of us, no one, has gone too far from the reaches of God's grace. The suffering servant, who's now the triumphant king, calls the unbeliever to see your sin and how it separates and, and allow the scapegoat, the suffering servant, the Messiah, to take it away forever. But Jesus also calls the believer in here to find refreshment in our King. To find our greatest joy in this God, the God of the universe, who was the suffering servant, but is now the triumphant King. Father, I thank you for your word in this text today. It is enough to fill us up to overflow with praise, possibly with conviction, moving to repentance and belief, possibly for the believer just uh, giving time to repent in the sense that maybe we just haven't given you the, the affection and the, and the worship that's yours. We haven't exalted you in our daily conversations. We'd rather tear down people instead of lift them up. I pray, God, for repentance. Father, tonight we get to tell about ministry in New York City. But I pray that a testimony night like tonight will become something that happens all the time as, as people of God give testimony to how you're working right in our neighborhoods, right in our workplace, our schools, our Walmarts and food lines. this world today, Father. Thank you for being enough. May we worship with great joy. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Church family, this morning we have an opportunity to respond. Worthy is the Lamb. What an appropriate way to exalt the Lamb, the suffering servant. Would you stand as we worship together? If you'd like to pray with someone, maybe you're in a place where you recognize, I just haven't exalted the King. I need to humble myself before my brothers and sisters. That's great. Come down. I'd love to pray with you. Others would love to pray with you right where you are. If you're here today and you're like the eunuch, you're, I, I, there's no way I can know God. But the Spirit's doing a work. There are people in this room like Philip 
who may be the Spirit's prompting right now, go speak to so-and-so. Do it. That's what this time is for. The time to respond to what the Spirit's doing. So let's exalt the King. Worthy is the Lamb. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you